joining us. Um, thanks, Nolene or Lali. <laughs> we are going to re be recording the session, but yes, I'll hand over to Mark soon. But please feel free to to raise your hand and uh, add to the discussion, and that's that's what we're here to do. So, thanks again, Mark. Over over to you. Thanks, Natalie, and hello, everyone. It's good to be here. I've done a few of these sessions and really enjoy it. So just to introduce myself, for those who don't know me, my name is Mark Turpin, and I work as a coach uh, of individuals and teams and groups, an independent consultant, and occasional lecturer at its business school, and also as a mediator um, with conflict dynamics. Um, so I've got a fairly varied practice, which takes me into some interesting organizations and situations and uh, really enjoy this kind of process um, in which I can share some thoughts and ideas, but also learn quite a lot myself from engaging with you all. So thank you so much for being here, especially on this theme, time management. I mean, there's so many books, probably podcasts, webinars, uh, websites which look at time management. So there is a, a wealth a wealth of material that you can access, um, some of which is just fairly straightforward and predictable, um, some of which can sometimes be a little bit more interesting. But I hope that the conversation we have today can be at the interesting end. So I'm not just repeating um, things that you can find on any website or any Google search about time management. Uh, usually we go through from um, about now for about an hour, hour and a half, and partly depending on the questions that people ask and how much you engage, the more you engage with me and maybe sometimes challenge me, the more we learn. So it's really good if you can bring examples from your own experience of the issues that we talk about. And then we can make it very real in terms of the conversation. Um, so we'll, we'll open now. And I, I guess I'll start off just by sharing a few thoughts around time management. I suppose from a philosophical perspective, time is where we live. This is where we are. And it is the movement of time that gives us the opportunity to make meaning of the world and, and do things that are useful and uh, take care of ourselves and B, um, time is in a sense the fourth dimension after we think about space and where we are. We move through the time dimension. So this is what we have. And in a sense, nothing else. It's only our opportunity to be in time and to do things and connect with each other that makes uh, makes everything real and possible. So sometimes people say, oh, I wish I had more time. You often hear that. Oh, I'm so busy. I wish I had more time. There is no more time and there is all the time. And this is what we have. And the, there's nothing else coming. There's no more. There's only what we have and what we live in. So I laugh sometimes when people say that, oh, I wish I had more time as if you could have less time or more time. There is only the time that we are in. No more and no less. So don't have any expectations that more is coming because it's not. This is all we have. Uh, so time is where we live. And I think for that reason, one of my starting points is that time gives us the opportunity to be respectful of who we are and who other people are and what's important for ourselves and others and provides us an opportunity to organize us, ourselves in the time, the only time that is, which is the time which is now. There's a slightly sort of philosophical kickoff, but I think I would just say, yeah, that no more is coming. All there is is what we have in terms of time. And that's what we have to work with. We can't make more of it. 
Of course, we can waste it. That's easy to do. We can waste time and end up with less, I suppose, in that sense, or end up with nothing if we waste the time we have. So it's really good to have respect for ourselves and for the times, the time and the times that we live in and respect for other people as well who share this journey with us. So, yeah, time is what there is. And a good starting point, I think, when, in a very practical sense, thinking about managing our time, is really just to quantify how we divide it up and work with it. So in a, in a week, we have 168 hours. 168 hours, no more, no less, in any given week. And sometimes when people are struggling with managing their time, I don't know if one can manage time easily, it's just what it is. It's not going to change. It's not going to go away. It's not going to come in greater quantities. So managing time itself is a slightly funny idea. But when people are struggling with dealing with time, I sometimes start with um, the 168 hours idea. And you can make a pie chart. And you could even do it if you've got a piece of paper with you now, just make a little pie chart. And assume that that is how you are going to divide up your 168 hours. Obviously, some of it, a big chunk of it goes on sleep. If you have eight hours or like to have eight hours sleep every night, then that's 56 hours gone straight away from your 168. So you can make a portion of your pie chart, your 168 hours for those 56 hours or however many it is that you prefer to have for sleeping. It's a big chunk. And then there is a chunk and another big chunk usually that goes on time that is allocated in your life for working. If it's eight hours and it's um, five days a week, eight hours a day, that's another 40 hours gone straight away. So between your 50, 56 hours sleeping and your 48 hours um, working, or oh, 40 hours working, that's, uh, what, 96 hours gone before you do anything else in your life. And I usually ask people to make a pie chart because making it visual is quite a good way to think about how you divide and allocate your time that you are given. And then the rest of the time, the another 70-odd um, hours, is for everything else that you do. It's from getting up, having your breakfast, sitting in traffic, all the other things you do, going to the supermarket, anything pleasant you might do at the weekend, um, sitting in the garden, whatever it happens to be, is the time that is allocated for everything else. And that's all there is. That pie chart is how you divide your time. And sometimes when I talk with people and ask them to do this exercise, they are quite surprised when they look at the pie chart after they've divided it up to see how much time they do different, they spend on different things. It can be a big shock, for example, for people to realize sometimes how much time they spend sitting in traffic, going to and from an office. Uh, because if you spend two or three hours a day sitting in traffic, which many people do, uh, just going to and from the office, then that can be another 20 hours gone before you do anything productive. You're just sitting driving a car, getting stressed out in the, the rush hour traffic. And that can be a big shock when people actually add up those hours and put them into the pie chart. I think that this is often a really good first step to think about managing time. Because managing time means you're going to try and make some changes or do some things a bit differently from how you've been doing them up until now. 
And it's what I would call the awareness part of managing your time. And that is to just become fully aware of how you currently divide up your week, how you currently spend your time. So I'd recommend doing that pie chart on the 168 hours. Be honest with yourself. And just think about how much time you spend doing different things. Become aware. That's the first stage. Become aware of how you are organizing your time. Or sometimes not organizing it, but just doing it without really thinking about it. So to create that self-awareness is a really good start. For the whole week, I would do it for yourself. It can be a bit scary. Has anybody been doing it as we've been speaking? Maybe if some of you would like to grab a piece of paper and just create that pie chart for yourself, very roughly, it doesn't have to be perfectly exact. And just put in how many hours you spend sleeping, how many hours you spend working, how many hours you spend sitting in traffic, and that kind of thing. If there are hours that you spend in church every week or whatever, you can put it all on the pie chart. But you need to come to a total of 168 hours. There's no more and no less. And that in itself can sometimes um, be quite stark when you see it. And can be a bit depressing sometimes. Um, and can certainly lay the basis for starting to make decisions about how you do want to arrange your time. Any questions so far, just on the awareness side, or any thoughts or reflections? Don't be shy. Oh, Wendy, social media takes up some time. Um, I would rather spend doing something else. Yes, it's something that we will talk about. Do you have any idea how much time you spend on social media? That could be another question for all of you. How much time do you actually spend on social media? And it's not necessarily all bad. Not necessarily all bad. Because sometimes people are working on LinkedIn, working on social media to promote their work or something like that can be quite useful. But also probably all of us, if we're being honest with ourselves, spend quite a lot of time on social media. And it could be hours sometimes in a week, many hours, which is maybe a little bit more frivolous or less useful. So social media, not all bad, but you might want to think about how many of those 168 hours are you spending um, on perhaps social media gazing that is a little bit more frivolous. Mark, there, there's there's actually an app for that. <laughs> That'll there's tell you how much time you've spent per week on each uh, platform. It's very interesting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if you actually want to track it like that. Yeah. So being honest with yourself also, you might put it down, you might put these down at work hour, as work hours or as... Um, home relaxation hours, I don't know. But social media probably comes into both categories and it's quite useful to try and think for yourself when you do that pie chart, how much of it am I actually spending on rather perhaps frivolous or mildly entertaining but not very productive social media gazing? It's a good question. Thanks, Wendy. No, I think the the point about the awareness side is that awareness can be the basis then for starting to make some decisions about what you want to do and what I would call the second part of managing time, which is arranging 
your week or arranging your time and starting to create maybe a new pie chart, which is how you would like to spend your week and how you want it to be and what changes do you want to make so that you are managing your time in a better way. And I think that in this sense, I'm not trying to say that you must take out things that are enjoyable. We're not trying to take away social media or watching TV at the weekends or whatever it is you do. Um, it's just about being aware of how you decide to spend your time and how much time you want to spend doing different things. And I'm approaching this, I suppose, really from the point of view, firstly, of thinking about all the time that you have, both at work, both at work and your own personal time. So the whole of the 168 hours that you have. So time management in that sense is thinking about managing all of your time. And I will come on a little bit later to, to very specifically how we think about managing time at work, which is a significant part of, of what we think about when we talk about time management. It's about how do we manage our time at work. But of course, it is a much broader concept than that. We're also thinking about how we manage our time generally. And what changes do we want to make in that? So we start with awareness, then we move on to the arrangement, which is the new way we want to think about how we spend our time. And of course, when it comes to our domestic time, our own personal time, there are 100 million things that we can do or choose to do uh, with our lives. And some of them may be good for us, some of them may not be so good for us. It's up to us to decide how we want to spend our own personal time. But I would say now that generally for professional people, and I'm assuming you are all professional people, who want to be organized and who respect yourselves in terms of being a professional person, usually one has to think about dividing our time in certain ways. So we will spend a certain amount of time working. We will spend a certain amount of time at leisure doing our own thing, uh, and so on. Normally, people talk about for finding some kind of balance in their lives, which is important if we want to reduce the stress of modern life, the stress of work, and so on. Finding some kind of balance is useful. And time management can be a really important way of thinking about how we want to create the balance that we need in our lives. And if we think about creating balance, we're usually talking about mind, body, spirit kind of stuff. We're thinking about how we engage ourselves with our minds intellectually, at work, at school. We are also thinking about our physical health and well-being. So how much time do we spend in the gym, exercising, looking after ourselves, planning our diet, and all those kind of things. And then there is the spiritual dimension that people speak about, which is how we look after our um, mental and spiritual well-being. Do we go to church? Do we do yoga? Or do we have some practices where we're thinking about ourselves as spiritual beings as well. And in thinking about arranging our time, it is very valuable to try to make sure that we are allocating time for all these different aspects of ourselves, mind, body, and spirit, and not to neglect too much, at least not to neglect too much any of these particular areas, because they are all important in terms of who we are. Even just the idea of 
spending time with friends. And this is something some of you will have heard me speak about before. Uh, the importance of social connection, friendship, uh, is not to be underestimated at all. And as I mentioned in some of our earlier sessions, they are now showing that these days, one of the best predictors for healthy living and healthy lifestyle is the quality of our personal relationships. The quality of our personal, more than giving up smoking, going to the gym and things like that. Um, the importance of our social connections. So I think in terms of those 168 hours that we are thinking about, it's really important to think about um, how are we spending time with friends, with our social networks, and so on. It's not frivolous. And it's not about being on Facebook either. So it's not about the um, social media side, but it's about real connection with, with people. Um, yeah. So any questions so far? We've talked about awareness and we're now starting to talk about arranging time. I do encourage people not to be shy, but you are generally very quiet in these sessions. <laughs> Does it make sense so far? Is this useful? Maybe I'm looking for some feedback. <laughs> Awareness helps a lot, Christopher. Yeah, just becoming aware and making an image of it or making a picture, that 360 degree pie chart or something like that can be quite visual in terms of, oh, this is actually how I'm spending my time and I thought it was more or less doing this or that. Um, we have to spend a lot of time doing things that sometimes are fairly mundane, going to the supermarket, things like that. Um, yeah. Prioritizing things that are important to you. Um, life is short, certainly, and it can disappear when you weren't looking. I think sometimes just in terms of uh, going back to this point about networks and connections, uh, we think that our friends will just always be there and we don't have to make too much of an effort. We'll bump into them from time to time and see them. It doesn't require any kind of particular effort. I think making an effort becomes important in terms of the new arrangements that we want to make. Um, sometimes these things require effort. We're going to make an effort to go and see somebody or to reconnect with somebody that we have neglected maybe for a while. Um, no Monday, yes, just making a rough pie chart and visualizing it really helps. Yeah, it's a simple thing. And whenever I have a team of people or I'm coaching people who are struggling with time management, I use I use this pie chart as a a good starting point. And then it can create a really good uh, discussion around, okay, then what do we want to change or what has to be different? Um, and there are always ways in which we can find to improve and adapt. So arranging the pie chart and then maybe create a second pie chart of how you would like it to be. How would you like it to be? If you could make changes, what changes would you make to it? And if you're going to add in something new, going to the gym or whatever it is, something else is going to have to come from it. So you, you can't just keep on adding more and more things and assume that everything will hold because I said, as I said before, there's no more time coming. You've only got those 168 hours. So if you decide to spend three hours a week in the gym, which is really good. You have to find those three hours from somewhere else or stop doing something else, maybe social media. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, maybe the awareness and the arrangement um, are fairly straightforward things to do. 
And then I go right on to the question that Nomonde has just put in the chat, how to make it sustainable. This is now what I call the adaptation phase. So awareness, arrangement, and then adaptation. Adaptation is then kind of monitoring how it's going, because then you, you really are going to start changing things in your life. How do you make it sustainable? You need to actually monitor and see, does it work? Is this possible? Is it feasible that I can spend three hours going to the gym? Especially because I hadn't taken account of the fact that it takes me 15 minutes to get there, 15 minutes to get back. So three hours suddenly becomes three and a half. So it's very easy to think that you're just um, making an easy change, but actually how do you manage that and what are the other implications? of it. You have to make it sustainable. I call that the adaptation phase, which is really where you start monitoring and rethinking if this new, if the new arrangements that you're putting in place are working. Because the first two parts are quite easy. Doing a pie chart is quite easy and making a new pie chart is quite easy, but then you actually have to implement it. It becomes about real change. So you have to adapt and monitor how you are doing with it. Sometimes it's very useful to get feedback from somebody. Somebody you know, somebody you trust, or a life partner, or somebody who can give you um, feedback on how you are doing with the changes that you want to make in managing your time. Um, that can be very valuable. I hope and would think that it's um, doing this is something which, although it's seen as a kind of corporate -y kind of thing, doing all this should actually make your life better, should help you to feel better, should help you to feel more productive, um, fitter, um, and generally happier with your life. When you are taking control of the hours that you spend rather than just spending them, without really thinking about what is involved. Um, I'm just looking at the questions here in the chat. Londwa, you say the best thing about exercise is it pushes one to start to prioritize where you really want to spend your time. Um, and then to say a different aspect to this is recognizing the unbalanced individualistic responsibility of managing time. But if eight hours in a day is dedicated to sleep and also another eight hours spent in working, something can be said about the imbalance there. Yeah. I think that, you know, the times we live in raise a lot of these kind of questions because people are saying more and more, why should I have to spend an hour and a half, two, two and a half hours every day, every working day sitting in traffic, going to an office? which is a huge amount of unproductive and stressful time. And if it is possible increasingly to reduce that or eliminate that, it frees up a lot of time to do other things that may be more important or useful or productive. So that is why the idea of home working, um, even if it's just one or two days a week, if one is in a position to negotiate that with your employer, can be incredibly valuable um, because you free up time to do other things um, which are less stressful, make you happier, um, more productive and so on. So thinking with your employer also about how you spend your time, how much is on unproductive uh, things, or unfulfilling things uh, can be incredibly valuable. No wonder you like the feedback part from others because when evaluating yourself, one can be biased, it's very true. So um, yeah, getting feedback can be very valuable. Um, sometimes people are a little bit embarrassed about how much time they spend on their social media networks, for example. <laughs> Um, so you might not want to share that with people. Uh, but the value, value of feedback, yeah. Yes. So I, I think I've given you a kind of overall 
perspective on thinking about the whole of your time and your week and so on. Of course, if you think it in terms of a month or a year, you can also come with another pie chart if you want. Um, because not every week of the year is the same as every other week. We are given leave, for example, by most employers. We are entitled to a certain amount of leave. And those weeks are not the same or should not be the same as the weeks you spend when you are working. So you can look at it in an even bigger context. And I would say that, again, from my experience working with executives for many years, the amount of unpaid or untaken leave, the amount of untaken leave that employees are carrying is shocking. People sometimes will work for the whole year without taking any leave and carry it over to the next year. Um, and eventually, of course, you lose some of it because your employers will start to write it off. But leave is there as an employee benefit. And planning and arranging to take leave uh, and then do other things during that time is also an incredibly important part of managing time, managing your own time effectively. Because we all need sometimes some time out or some um, escape from the daily grind of our working lives. So I would also say to people, I often say to people, when you are planning your year, plan to take leave, plan those dates in the diary, make sure your employer knows when you're going to take leave. Um, and yeah, make sure that you are committed to that. And then in those leave times, use that time well in a way that works for you and gives you the kind of rest and recreation that we all need sometimes. A lot of employees carry a lot of leave which they never take. They think that the company will reward them one day for working extra hard, or for not taking leave. No, it doesn't happen, by the way. Um, your leave will eventually be written off if you don't take it. <laughs> So take your leave. Any questions? Any thoughts? Okay, if you want to put anything in the chat, it's also good, works well. I keep that at the side of my screen. So I think I'm saying really, in summary so far, that for the whole of your lives, the whole of your working and um, social lives, that 168 hours is what you've got every week. No more and no less. Become aware of how you are using it, how you're dividing it up. That's the awareness part. And that's a really good start. The second thing I'm saying is that you can then choose to arrange it differently if you wish to do so. I don't think there are many of us who've got the perfect balance. So have a look at how you are spending your time currently and then maybe create a new pie chart where you are arranging it differently in a way that works better for you. So the second part after the awareness is the arrangement. Make that new pie chart. Um, yeah. And the third part then, I suppose, is the adaptation part, where you start monitoring how it actually works in practice. And then you might need to make some more changes so that it's really working for you. So awareness, arrangement, adaptation are really the three aspects that I think are important. And I would then also say in the background of that, it's very useful to keep in your mind this perspective of mind, body, and spirit, that we have to exercise ourselves in all these different ways. It's good to work and it's good to study and apply your mind to solving problems and, and being productive and so on. It's good to do the exercise 
however you choose to do that, but keep your body fit and trim as much as possible. And then the spiritual dimension of making sure that how you make meaning of the world and how you connect with the world and, and whatever else may be out there is also catered for, whether it's part of a religious observance or being a Buddhist or doing your Tai Chi or whatever it happens to be, but keeping your mind um, freed as well. And I think this is also a gateway to general good health and happiness, but it requires that planning to make sure that you are allocating your time in a way that works for you to those three, three different dimensions of our beings. So I think that's my overall perspective on managing time. And what I would do then is I would go on to talk about very specifically managing time at work, because this is a very specific aspect of um, how we have to think about time, which is of interest, of course, to our employers as well as to ourselves. I mean, I've been approaching it from the perspective so far of thinking about ourselves and what the decisions we want to make about our own lives. But then when it comes to uh, time at work and how we spend time at work, this is also something of great interest to our employers as well. So generally, there should be a good conversation that takes place in workplaces around how people manage time as well. So if it's okay, I'm going to focus now a little bit on the, the work side of the work side of managing time well. But just any questions on where we've got to so far? Everyone okay? Okay, well, this what I'll do then is I'll approach the work question, which is one big portion of that 168 hours. And I think, first of all, if I take it from the big picture perspective, the amount of time we spend at work. If you are spending um, 40 hours, 50 hours, sometimes even 60 hours at work, it is starting to become unhealthy. It's starting to become unhealthy. And they are showing that extra hours at work do not make you more productive. Um, and do not, they're not a benefit for the company or for you. Um, and nobody is actually going to reward you very often for putting in hours. And again, the corporate world is benefits to some extent, I suppose it benefits, but there is a huge amount of extra time that people are giving for free to their employers because they have an idea or they think that somehow they are going to be rewarded if they put in more hours. Not true, people. And you're certainly not more productive by spending many, many extra hours sitting in the office, pretending to work or doing your social media or whatever you're doing on the side. So I think the first thing I would say is that as much as possible, once you've done 40 hours a week, that should be it, people. That should be it. And... More than that, you are not generally being productive. Wendy, more hours are certainly expected by employers, traditionally so, traditionally so. But they're not necessarily getting extra benefit from it. And now there are people around the world and in South Africa who are campaigning for the idea of a four-day working week instead of a five-day working week. And they've done trials, even in South Africa, which show that if people work for four days in a week, they are just as productive as people who are working for five days. Just as productive overall. They get as much done as well, um, as efficiently and as productively as people who are working for the five days. So more hours, and there's evidence that shows this, more hours do not actually mean that the employer is getting more out of you. 
In fact, if you can imagine that we would be moving, as we probably will over the next number of years, increasingly to a four-day working week, um, that creates huge opportunities for people to think very creatively about how they spend a, a longer weekend or three days of leisure rather than two days of leisure, uh, where you have opportunities to, to do many more different things with your own time. So I think we have to seriously challenge the idea that extra hours means you are more productive or doing more work for the company. Not true. And certainly not good for your own mental health, well-being and stress. That needs to be a conversation increasingly within uh, businesses. And as I say, the evidence is there from people who've been working for a four-day week, including in South Africa, that people are just as productive and can achieve as much in four days as they would normally achieve in five. It's difficult to challenge the status quo, of course, but the research is increasingly showing this. And um, you can you can find it on, on the internet. Uh, sometimes maybe some traditional managers think that if they can see somebody sitting in an office playing on a computer that they're being productive for the business. Uh, probably not. I think this is this trend away from five days to four, four and a half or four is something that is going to accelerate in line with a lot of other changes taking place in the world of work. And certainly for myself, when, you know, by 12 o'clock on a Friday, my emails dry up. I get far fewer emails from people on a Friday afternoon than I would on a Friday morning or other parts of the week, because I think a lot of people are checking out and going home. It's happening more and more that Friday afternoon is a write-off. And probably increasingly Fridays will move in that direction as well. And I think it's part of a trend that includes things, <coughs> sorry, includes things like home working as well. Um, because more and more uh, companies are increasingly allowing people to spend some time, not necessarily the whole week, but some time every week working from home. It has, it has many benefits, both for the business and for the employee. Because firstly, the employee for every day that they don't have to drive to the office is starting to save some travel time. And if people are living two, two and a half, three hours um, in the traffic away from the office every day, if you spend one day a week at home, you immediately save that two and a half, three hours for that particular day, every week. And you're saving that two or three hours. Some people spend a lot more than that in traffic. Not only do you save the time, but you also save the stress of navigating through the traffic. You save the petrol cost. Um, so there are many benefits for the employee, employee uh, to spend even just one day a week working from home. Uh, but also there are benefits for the employer as well, because um, employers who allow their people to spend some time every week working from home can start to save on office costs, office rental, um, and, and so on. So the, there's a saving in direct financial terms for businesses as well. They do not have to provide accommodation for people to sit in an office for five days, but only for four. That's 20% of your office accommodation needs can be saved. So apart from having happier um, employees, because employees like to work from home sometimes, there are also direct benefits for um, the companies as well. So the working from home idea, if it's organized well, can be a win-win both for the business and for um, employees as well. And this is also about thinking about managing time well. Um, the, why do you want to pay people to spend 
um, five days a week coming to the office when they go through all the stress, the traffic, arrive in the office stressed out before they've even done um, any work. People are stressed out sometimes. So you can see that the benefits become obvious. And in fact, it's a kind of no brainer to at least start thinking about um, how people spend their time in the office or working from home. It's not always possible for everyone to uh, work from home. Some people do need to be at a workstation or if you're in a call center, um, you know, sometimes people do need to be sitting at a desk in an office. But for many professional people, there are great opportunities to allow them to work from home at least some of the week. If you save two and a half hours a day by doing that, it gives you time maybe to take the kids to school and even uh, walk around the garden or something a little bit. Even before you switch on the computer, you've still saved, um, you've still saved some time before you switch on your laptop. And you're certainly much less stressed um, than negotiating on the N1 highway. So that's my kind of general introduction to thinking about uh, time management in the work context, that there are win-win benefits that can be negotiated for uh, company and employees in terms of thinking generally about how and where people are spending their time at work. It's not always possible to let people spend all their time working at home. And usually we are working towards some kind of hybrid arrangement in many companies that are allowing some, some of the week people can work at home and some of the time we ask them to come into the office. And maybe there's a kind of division amongst the employees that on Mondays, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, some people are working from home. Other people are expected in the office and then Wednesdays, Thursdays and Fridays, it shifts again to another group of people or it's done by the alphabet according to your name or whatever. But it raises lots of interesting possibilities to start thinking about hybrid working. Then I've spoken a little bit about... Um, yeah, when we get into the office now, this 40 hours, how are we going to be productive within those 40 hours? Don't make it 50 hours, but try to make it 40. And time management is, good time management is one of the ways that you can achieve what you need to do within that 40 hour week, rather than having 50, 60 hours working weeks. And I can promise you, and I know from experience talking to people that when people are working 50 or 60 hours a week, there is very little good time management happening. People are not managing their time well in that context usually. Um, so good time management enables one to be more productive, more efficient, and achieve what you want to achieve at work in a reasonable period of time. Um, so thinking about then how you organize your 40 hours or your eight hours in a day is also incredibly valuable. I'm just looking at your chat, Christopher. During COVID, I worked from home a lot. However, I found I worked more hours than when I was at the office. That's also something that has happened. Every time I wanted to stop working, I felt guilty and continued. How do we deal with this? Well, yeah, look, I, I've heard that that has happened quite a bit as well. Sometimes people are not good at switching off. They just find their workspace in, at home and stay in there. And you don't have the benefit of connecting with your fellow employees quite as much. So these are things to think about when you are, if you're working from home how you still manage to make connection. Maybe sometime you do go into the office sometime during the week and other times you're working from home. And you, this look, this requires um, both the, the awareness of how you're spending your time, because this applies to the office situation as well. How am I dividing my time when I'm in the office? 
How would I like to rearrange those eight hours? And again, you can do another pie chart for yourself just for the office time. And how do I want to adapt and change as I have experience in working with new ways? So I think, I want, you know, one of the things that people often talk about is I spend so much time in meetings. I spend so much time in meetings and they are so unproductive and so wasteful. Um, but I just have to be there. People expect us to be in meetings all the time. And that can be soul destroying the amount of time people spend in meetings. So there are a whole range of strategies that one can apply to that. I'll cover some of them just now. But meetings are generally um, very often a big waste of executive and professional time. And then another thing that happens is people spend a lot of time on emails, which keep coming all day long and need to be replied to. So managing emails is another thing that people need to think about. And then the interruptions that happen at work, uh, where people walk in through your door and they say, no, they start uh, shooting the breeze about something. It could be to do with work, it could be personal stuff or whatever, but they're shooting the breeze and it's distracting you from what you are trying to do. So interruptions can be something to think very carefully about managing. Um, so usually in most of my coaching work, I'm talking to people about managing meetings, managing emails, managing interruptions, um, those kind of things. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about each of these. Um, Christopher, you said, I have a lot of those interruptions because my office is located at the entrance to the building. Yeah, good point. Yeah, so you're going to have to think about maybe sometimes putting a notice on the door saying, in a meeting, back at 12 o'clock or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to suggest we take a, a two-minute leg stretch, if that's okay. We usually do it at around this time. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about how to manage um, your time in terms of thinking about meetings, thinking about emails, thinking about managing interruptions and so on, um, if that's okay. So can we take a, a short break? Uh, I see it's now, according to my, my laptop, it's 1.55. So let's come back uh, just before two o'clock, if that's okay. And then we'll talk about managing these other factors. Is that okay? Thumbs up, people. People happy? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, people. Let's do that. Thanks, Mark. Okay.
Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming back. I hope we're having fun. I think I'll, I'll kick off first now with this question of meetings and the amount of time that people have to spend or think they have to spend in meetings, which becomes a really big issue for a variety of reasons, one of which is that meetings are often not well handled or the meetings themselves are not managed well. And often there is no agenda or people are sitting delivering a PowerPoint presentation and we are a bit bored and sitting there playing with our cell phones underneath the table. Um, we spend a lot of time in meetings and we think, well, that was a waste of time. Um, surely I shouldn't have to spend so much time sitting in meetings. And there was a company that I was working for a while back that was it's actually a French company and it was overtaken uh, taken over by a German company. And when the Germans came in, they said, okay, we're going to ban PowerPoint in meetings banning PowerPoint in meetings because it's a waste of time. They said, you can still do your PowerPoint before the meeting. Send it round to everybody who's going to attend the meeting. And then when they come to the meeting, we will assume that they've seen the PowerPoint presentation and they can come with any questions. And we spend our meeting time productively thinking about what we need to do and what the issues are because we can share the PowerPoints using technology beforehand. There's no reason to bring people into a meeting room and go through the PowerPoint at our own time, which may not be the time, the uh, own speed, which may not be a suitable speed for people attending, maybe too fast or too slow. Um, it's a waste of time to do that. So send the PowerPoint round beforehand. People can look at it in their own time and come with questions and use the meeting time productively. I mean, the amount of, um, the, or the cost of management time that is spent sitting in unproductive or meetings that are not well managed is huge and often very wasteful. So the idea of not having PowerPoints presented in meetings is an exciting and useful one uh, worth thinking about means that people have to be now more prepared, and more strategic in terms of thinking about how we use the meeting time productively. But anyway, sometimes we can't all do that and we have to sit through the, the PowerPoints. But then the other question is, and I think it's an important question, we are invited to meetings, do we just go because Sometimes people are half expected or because they're invited to a meeting, do you just go, um, even though you think that it's going to be unproductive or a waste of your time? Or do you think more strategically about whether it is useful for be me to be in that meeting? Um, is it really useful for me to be there? And if the content of the meeting is useful, but I'm under pressure for time, could I see? Could I ask if the meeting can be recorded? Just as we are recording this session, means that other people who may not be able to attend today may also have access to the learning that comes from the session. And we can do that at work as well with meetings. We can try and encourage a practice in which meetings that are important are recorded and circulated for people who for one reason or another may not be able to attend at that particular time. Um, but would nonetheless be interested in going through the recording or some of the recording of the meeting at a later point. So recording meetings is a very good way also of helping to manage people's time. <coughs> and I think this is it's also partly about uh, having respect for people, having respect for each other, recognizing that sometimes people are under pressure um, and that if we can use technology smartly. Um, we can respect people's time issues 
and use meetings productively in that sense. Not everybody may always have to be in a particular meeting, but can sometimes still benefit from hearing a recording um, or a video clip or something like that. Um, so I think that can be very valuable. Think about whether you really do need to be in every single meeting that you go into. Encourage a culture to develop in which meetings are generally recorded and the contents can be circulated to people afterwards for those who are not able to attend or not able to attend at that particular time. That's about respecting your own time um, and not just collapsing as soon as somebody says, oh, no, we're having a meeting, you have to be there. Uh, could the meeting be recorded? Could we get copies afterwards of the recording is an important question. And of course, nowadays, there are uh, also um, AI apps that can be used that people can be encouraged to um, have on their laptops. Uh, when you are in a meeting, in the, the apps that can give you transcriptions of the uh, meetings and the decisions that may be made afterwards. And they will do this just from, from your laptop if you have the right app. I forget some of the names, but there are a number of different um, AI apps that will do this for you, will give you a transcription of the meeting and the decisions made. That can be incredibly valuable as a way of at least making sure that um, the meeting is um, productive and gives you some useful outcomes. You don't need to have people making uh, taking minutes anymore in meetings if you use the the app. Does anybody know what these apps are called? I forget myself the names of some of them, but there are a few different apps that people can use. Um, AI apps um, to transcribe meetings and give you a short summary of the decisions that are made. Uh, this can be very valuable. And why not use the opportunities of AI to uh, do this kind of thing, which can make meetings much more productive. Not have to wait for minutes to be produced a week later. Um, the minutes can be available uh, as soon as the meeting ends. Does anybody have experience of doing that, of using those those technologies? think about. Uh, you can explore the different AI apps that are available. There are quite a few of them. Um, Tebatsi, Tactic is one transcriber I have used. So there you are. Already people are starting to use. Um, and there are various others, and some of them uh, are better than others. Often if you pay for the, you can get the free version but if you pay for the one level up, you get some extra services. Um, so it's good to think about. Otter AI is another one. Yeah, there are a few. I've heard of Otter, I think. So don't get left behind by new technology, people. It can really help you in terms of organizing your, uh, organizing your um, life. And actually, if you integrate... Um, some of these AI apps with something like ChatGPT, uh, it becomes a really good way to produce reports, produce summaries, develop presentations, and so on, on the basis of what comes out of the meeting. Sometimes you can, two hours later, you've got not only the meeting recorded and transcribed and decisions recorded, but you've also developed the presentation that you are talking about in the meeting can be developed and with the client within a couple of hours, uh, which is quite interesting how you can start to uh, do these things very efficiently and very well. So meetings, think, yeah. Any questions about the meetings side? Are you all okay? Is that, is that a little bit helpful in terms of thinking about meetings?
good to make a conversation in your business around how we use meetings well, how we use them productively. How can we bring in artificial intelligence to help support our meeting processes? No substitute for creative thinking, of course, with a very human aspect which remains critically important and AI is never going to take away that human dimension. Okay, then the next thing that I just wanted to talk about a little bit about is about emails <coughs> and how people uh, think about their emails because we are sitting on our laptops a lot of the time and in the background emails keep coming through and demanding responses instantaneously, which is very unreasonable. And some of them are spam and some of them are... But it's really useful to think about how we are going to manage. And I think the first thing I would say is that the email also becomes an interruption. We'll talk a bit later about the interruptions, but the email itself is an interruption because we get a notification we see every time an email comes onto our laptop and immediately we go to it and either ignore it or we decide to de devise a response instantaneously or whatever. And in that sense, it is a real interruption from other work that we were doing and it can happen continually and all the time that these interruptions keep coming and distracting us from being able to focus on something perhaps more important or more productive we're trying to complete or finish off. And it doesn't work because it destroys the opportunity to plan our day, um, destroys the opportunity to plan our day. So, I think we have to get to the place where we are not distracted by emails every time an email comes in. A similar way of thinking also obviously about the beeps on our cell phones, the cell phone WhatsApp messages that come instantaneously, also an interruption. And I think that we need to come to the place where if someone sends an email they cannot just expect an instant reply within half an hour or within 10 minutes. It's very unreasonable and disrespectful around how people are trying to manage their time effectively at work. An email is not something that in its nature demands or needs always an instantaneous response. Sometimes people can call you, that's a little bit more um demanding of an immediate response if your manager calls you and you can respond um then it may be worth thinking about picking up the phone and responding but if he or she sends you an email that can sometimes wait a little bit or should be uh, something that you can wait on before responding to i think it's really good to allocate a time during your working day when you are spending when you are spending time responding or composing emails and only then and sometimes it could be in the morning i'm going to spend between i don't know eight and half past eight in the morning looking at my emails and responding to the ones that are important uh, maybe composing some emails that you need to send that you've been thinking about foolishly overnight <laughs> Um, and then maybe in the evening, again, you spend another half hour or so uh, dealing with emails that have come in during the day, um, composing any new emails that you need to send out. And if you are living in a very intensive email environment, you might even spend 10 or 15 minutes just before or just after a lunch break dealing with a couple of emails that may have come in so that you are responding and that you are present to the email world, but not uh, dealing with emails every two or three minutes, hopelessly inefficient. But to organize your time, certain chunks during the day, you can decide when you do it. 
according to what's important in your working environment. But think about how much time every day you want to spend on emails and then allocate those chunks of time to do that. And then the other times you see yourself as being free from email and not responding instantaneously to everything that comes in. This can be very challenging because we've got into these such bad habits of instantaneously responding, even when an instantaneous response is not necessarily needed. Uh, but I think think very carefully about how and where and when at the working during the working day you want to spend uh, re replying or composing emails. Coupled with which you can also think about who really needs to be copied in here. Do I need to just really copy everybody into this email? Is it really important everybody's copied in? Because again, so much waste in terms of people's going through emails and they're not necessarily important for them to be engaged with. You don't have to copy everybody into every email. Um, so I think thinking very smartly about use of email is incredibly valuable in terms of your managing your time and being really organized about how you spend your time. And then the other question, of course, is just these general interruptions that come because your office is sitting close to the entrance to the building. <coughs> It's important for you to have the self-respect uh, for yourself and for other people that says, I, I am available to people. I want to have an open door policy, but there are times when I do not want to be interrupted. If I'm trying to complete a report or develop a presentation and I just need some interrupted, uninterrupted time, it is really important for yourself to be able to close off the door sometimes. You can even have a notice that you put on the door saying, um, please don't interrupt, I'm busy with one, two or three, and I'll be available again from 12 o'clock or something like that. Um, so that people know that you are um, busy with something, that there are certain times when they can't just expect to open your door and come in and shoot the breeze or whatever it is. Um, that you need time when you can concentrate and focus on something that's important and that you can put that message out. Um, it shows that you are respectful of other people because you are giving them a time when you can be free again. So it's always a good idea to say, I'll be free from 12 or whenever it's going to be. But showing also that you respect your own time um, and you are looking after it carefully. Boitomelo, it's a little challenging if some people take offense for not picking up their call or not responding to emails instantaneously. Yeah, it is. And that's partly because we've developed these bad habits. Uh, we have developed these bad habits. And if somebody takes offense, you can say, look, I'm sorry, I was just busy that morning and I couldn't respond instantaneously to your email. Um, but whenever I can, I will. So you can make a commitment to yourself and to the other people around how you are going to manage this kind of thing effectively. It requires one to be assertive and to say, I was really busy that morning. I couldn't respond to the emails. I was really busy finishing the report um, and now I'm available again. But blocking out time when you don't want to be interrupted is about having respect for yourself and also ultimately for other people as well. Um, yeah, I think people have to learn not to take offense if you don't respond instantaneously. It's part of the jeopardy of having these things that people think you're always available, not only during working hours, but sometimes outside working hours as well. Good sometimes to switch these off or not to pick up the messages that come. So to deal with the interruptions, I think quite proactively, having respect for your own time and ultimately also for other people's time because it's good if one can help develop a culture in which people are also 
Other people are also managing their time effectively as well. And sometimes it is about not being available um, at certain times and being very available at others, <laughs> but not always instantaneously so, because otherwise you are opening yourself up to constant interruption, hopeless lack of organization, and a lot of unpro unproductive time as well. Yeah, so I think those are the kind of main thoughts I have about uh, managing time during working hours. Um, it is about having respect. It is about being fundamentally organized for yourself so that you can achieve within your 40 hour week uh, what you want to achieve. Um, I think it's about respect for yourself, but it is also about respect for other people. So I think that goes to if there is a meeting and if the meeting starts at 10 o'clock, being there at 10 o'clock, not being there at five past or 10 past or wandering in or out, uh, which shows a lot of disrespect for other people's time. So thinking about time management is both about having respect for your own time, but also having respect for the time of other people as well. Um, that if a meeting is scheduled to start at a certain time, that's when the meeting is going to start. And to build that culture is incredibly valuable. Questions, thoughts? I've covered quite a lot of ground. I'm just wondering any reactions. Good idea to distribute presentations beforehand, certainly, because it gives people time to think about what is being presented, to come with questions, and then enables you to have a really good conversation when the meeting happens about what is what is presented. Um, yeah. So I think that is a very valuable concept. If you are responsible for a presentation, send it around to people beforehand. This is the presentation. Um, please come to the meeting with any questions that you might have and we can have a really productive conversation. Yeah. Nolene, you say joining meetings late is a regular thing on Zoom and Teams. It drives me mad as it is so disrespectful. Yeah, I think it's just really good practice to to be there when the meeting starts as much as possible. Sometimes people have technology issues, but it should generally be um, in it should generally be a minority of people. Usually people now are sorted with the technology so you can be at the meeting when it starts. Questions, people? And some of these thoughts useful, some of these tools that I've given you helpful. Okay, you're very quiet. So look, I think in summary, what I'm saying is that have respect for yourself in terms of how you manage your own time and what is important for you. And as much as possible, do it also with respect for other people and their time. They're also busy people. They're also struggling with time management issues sometimes. So very useful to think about time management as an, an issue of respect and being organized for yourself and for the people around you. Um, there are cultural issues that we have to take, take head on in the workplace, and I've mentioned some of them, uh, to create a culture that re recognizes we want to be productive, we want to live balanced lives, and that ultimately it's going to be better for ourselves as individuals and also for the companies that we work for 
if we are productive in the time that we spend in the office and at home when we are working, um, and that there are times when we have to switch off and recognize that we have to work in ways that work for everybody um, and reduce stress because stress, as you know, is one of the big uh, killers at work. People get very stressed out and managing ourselves and being organized is a really good way of managing stress effectively for for all of us, I think. Try to get down to a 40-hour working week if possible. Is anybody here on a 40-hour working week or 50 hours? Let's just see what people think. 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours sometimes? Not helpful. Yeah. If you haven't already done it, make a pie chart for yourself. When do you try to limit it to 45? Yeah, very good idea. See if you can get it down towards 36. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think I'm more or less covered for um, today. Unless there are any final questions, I think we start to wrap it up. No, no, I'm glad you're on 40 hours. That's really good. Try and keep it there or even reduce it a little bit. And don't take work home with you also. <laughs> as much as possible. When you finish, finish. And you're doing something else. Oh, thanks for the great feedback, everybody. Thanks, Nolene. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. Um, very good. We will be doing another session later in the year. I forget when, when exactly it is. Nolene, do you remember when we are next meeting? I don't have the just, dates. Just give me a sec, please. Yeah. Because this is, I think, the second of four sessions that we might be doing, something like that. Thanks, Musa. It's 6th of June. 6th of June. And what are we discussing, Nolene? Remind me. Hang on a sec. Emotional intelligence. Uh, emotional intelligence, yeah. So important. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody, for your engagement and for listening. Enjoyed working with you, as always. Thanks, Christopher. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you so yeah. much for your time, Mark. We we really Thanks, do appreciate Nadine. it. Hopefully we'll we'll get people a bit more warmed up <laughs> in the middle of June to Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Conversation. <laughs> but thank you so much for your time and thank you again for everyone for joining us. We really appreciate it. And yes, keep coming back for, for more. Next one's on the sixth of June. Thanks Bye. a lot. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Uh, bye.